as you say, scientists are fallible, all humans are fallible. Nevertheless, the massive body of scientific evidence points one way. Surely you owe it to the children to teach that massive body of evidence rather than the, the writings of more fallible humans who, who were writing in the last couple of thousand years. I think the, the, the way the science has gone uh, since Darwin has been very defensive on the part of creationist people like myself. I think it's only in the past, let's say, 50 years since Crick and Watson, since the discovery of the incredible molecular complexity of life, that new evidence is emerging, such as things that have been assumed to be very old are now being proved to be much younger. In this very town at the university, apparently a Neanderthal skull was found to be only 250 years old. They could still smell the tissue. Apparently is a very worrying word. <laughs> it's a very pernicious word. I would question that apparently very, very strongly. There is no Neanderthal skull that is that recent. It is perfectly true that molecular evidence has shown that things are a lot more recent than we thought. For example, the split between the evolutionary split between humans and chimpanzees is now known to be approximately between five, six, seven million years, which is a lot more recent, much older than you'd think, but it's a lot more recent than was previously thought when all we had was fossils. It's true that molecular evidence has changed some of the details of what we know about evolution, but always in a, in a productive, constructive direction. And when you say that since Watson and Crick, new evidence has come to light, of course it has. And the new evidence is hugely and overwhelmingly confirming the tree of life, with minor details ch changing here and there, the, the tree of life that we'd already put together on comparative anatomy and fossil evidence. As I said, I think the methodology behind uh, radiometric dating is flawed, but new evidence is coming to light. Um, the amount of helium trapped in zircon crystals, the amount of helium in our own atmosphere, with all the alpha uh, uh, particle decay that's going on, the amount of so number of sodium ions in the sea, there are things that would cap the age of the Earth at thousands of years. And again, on the principle of falsifiability, it only needs one of those to be shown to be correct for all the others, the dating methods, to, to be proved false. Let me just confirm this. You are a teacher of science in a, in a major British school, and you think that the Earth is less than 10,000 years old? Yes, I do. Thank you. <laughs> now, um, but let me, let me go back to what I teach the children outside ke formal chemistry lessons. In chemistry, all I will do when I come across something that would perhaps challenge the, the, the preconceptions they have from biology is to just raise questions. And I think that is what a liberal education is all about. I, I'm not an American fundamentalist, right-wing sense of this sense that I want evolution to be taught. I want it to be set up, but to, not, to, to be able to criticise it as well seems taboo these days. And no, I mean, I, I think it's, it's right that we should teach um, controversial subjects and we should encourage children to think for themselves. There is, of course, plenty of controversy within evolution. I mean, evolutionists disagree about all sorts of things and that would be uh, fine. But when you say, um, people say things like teach both sides of the, of the controversy, that rather supposes that there is a there controversy and that there are two sides to it. I mean, why teach the biblical form? Why not teach the Hindu version with the cosmic butter churn or the, uh, uh, the Ebo version of <laughs> the world coming from the excrement of ants? I mean, there's any number of creationist theories that you could pick on. Well, I'm What's special I, about yes. the Judeo-Christian okay. one? Well, I'm afraid I am an atheist regarding all gods other than the Judeo-Christian yeah. one. I have to confess that. Um, but, but, that but, but that is my belief. What I think children are taught, though, these days, is very much a one-sided picture. My syllabus, things changed about three years ago. The, the QCA and the government put out a syllabus saying children should be taught how science works. A lot of what has happened in the last few years in my own teaching has come from the guidelines that children ought to now know, the, the principles of scientific methodology. <laughs> Therefore, I have responded to things that are well documented, and I've, I've, uh, I will pass them over at the end, to show that from our syllabuses we have to be taught in biology, for example. Children should know at GCSE the conflicting theories, plural, other than Darwinian evolution. Now what does that mean? Lamarck was discredited 50 years before, before uh, Darwin, was he not? I mean, what theories do they have in mind? I could show you a part of a chemistry syllabus that actually mentions the word creationism and mentions Bishop Usher, whose name is spelt wrongly, 
Uh, but I, I could show you that. Now, what is the point of the exam boards putting in things like that if they are then taboo in the classroom? Well, I'm not going to defend the exam board. Um, I, I am going to defend the idea that a scientific controversy should be taught and that children should be encouraged to think for themselves. And there are very many important controversies within science, but this isn't one of them. Now, let me just make a distinction between teaching in general studies, which I, I understand you also do. Yes, I do. As well as teaching in chemistry. I mean, do you think perhaps that, it, it, that, that the right place to teach this kind of thing is in, what shall we say, history of ideas? Okay, I mean, I think the, the argument most evolutionists would come up with is to say these things belong in religion. But on a practical level, that is unfair, because I've been at the same school for 35 years, and I don't think I've come across any of the, well, it's in, at least in double figures, RE teachers, who would have any science training at all, who would feel competent to deal with the sort of questions children ask. They would just say, go and ask the science teachers. And so if you say, we cannot have this taught in science, you're effectively condemning to the children to be indoctrinated with what I believe to be atheism. Because I think atheism and evolution go together, as your book says, and your book well, is a, an apologetic for, for atheism. And fair enough, that's fine, as long as you don't mind me in the classroom saying there is another side of the story. I'm somewhat unusual in, in, in <laughs> taking that view. Uh, the majority of my scientific colleagues, uh, w whether they're atheists themselves, would probably believe that you could be both religious and an evolutionist at the same time, as would essentially all educated churchmen. They might say that, but I think in the things have changed in the last few years and, and discoveries have been made, which, <clears throat> and the more we discover, the more staggering they, they become, that the Earth isn't very old, that evolution as a theory does fall at certain stages. You, um, there, there are no, there's no easy path up mountain, probably, if I may uh, borrow a phrase Certainly from yourself. May, and, yes. I, mean, just, I, I mean, I'm very amused by the titles of your books because you seem to bring religious titles into science, what are essentially science books, and you, you will deny me the right to do that in my uh, lessons to bring religion in. But anyway, never mind. Um, religious language <laughs> is a part of our culture. And, and so it should be in a science classroom too. But I, I don't brainwash the children with, with religion in a chemistry lesson. This year, um, since... Um, um, I, uh, articles about myself appeared in The, uh, in the Guardian and The Independent. Um, I've been asked by the school to teach general studies, which again is quite a, quite a difficult A-level with, no, with, with a syllabus. And my brief is to teach history and philosophy of science. And I was given on the first day back this school year, um, this is what you should teach, Mr. Cowan. And the first was th the theory of evolution and other theories, plural, of origins, plural. Now, I, again, take that as a, um, a remit to offer the children the idea that is prevalent and growing, whether, whether we like it or not, that there is another... They, they, you know this from biology. Well, I'm going to show you these DVDs from the Truth in Science organisation, which has reputable scientists at its head, and I will... Uh, did you say reputable scientists? Oh, yes, there's one with a, a doctor at the University of Leeds, for oh, example. Oh, wonderful, yes. Um, I think I know the one you mean. <laughs> I think we, we both know him, too. Well, all right, but th this is a... He, by the way, is a professor of thermodynamics yeah. who thinks that evolution violates the second law of thermodynamics. <laughs> well, it doesn't, because the sun is a source of energy. Yes, but exactly. But I would say undirected energy is rather like putting a bull in a shiny shop. It not, does not create order. It needs intelligence and energy. Well, undirected energy won't create order, but what will create order is non-random natural selection. <laughs> and that seems to be the one thing that you people don't get. Natural selection is not random. Repeat, natural selection is not random. It's the very opposite of random. But, it, it, OK, we're, we're getting up the subject again, but it doesn't matter. Going back to, a ra uh, to mutation, Mutation seems to me to damage DNA rather than to create anything new. That's my problem. The vast majority of mutations damage DNA. The vast majority of mutations are changes in the wrong direction. It's the minority that are in the right direction, which are favoured by natural selection. That's the non-random arrow that points, nat that points evolution in a constructive direction. All right. I mean, I get children at school coming to me saying, Mr. Cow, we've heard you don't believe in evolution with incredulity. And I say, well, yes, I do. But it depends what you mean by evolution. If you mean changes in time within a species, no problem at all. If you call it, whether you call that um, variation or microevolution, I have no problem with those things. The problem I have is with speciation with macroevolution. And I liken this to 
drawing a graph on the board with three points and extending the graph ten miles without any further evidence. Well, and there's a lot of further evidence. I mean, you're, you're right, of course, that we believe that macroevolution is microevolution produced over a long period, and there's no reason why that shouldn't happen. Uh, there, is, there are some cases where it seems to have happened remarkably quickly. I mean, we know, for example, that Lake Victoria is only about 100,000 years old. It's very, 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 very young. And during that time, about 450 species of cichlid fish have all evolved, apparently from a common ancestor. And that's, uh, that's very fast. Again, it's not fast by well, your standards. <laughs> you think the world's only 6,000 years old. But, but nevertheless, by, e by evolution, by scientific standards, 100,000 years is an eye blink. But I would say they're all fish. They're all cyclic fish. I'm not a biologist, of course. Well, of course they're all fish, but I mean, <laughs> they're fish not are reptiles. enormously variable. Uh, they're not reptiles, well, they're not amphibians. It just takes a bit longer, that's all. It just takes well, a bit see, longer. Well, you see, that's where we, dis we would disagree. And I think children need to know that even within the world of evolutionary theory, there are problems. There are problems with the Big Bang Theory, as it's taught in a godless way by scientists. But back to general studies, I feel as children already know a lot about evolution from GCSE biology, then by showing the truth in science material, I'm in a sense redressing the balance. And I'm, I'm basically a liberal. I'm not a fundamentalist right winger, as in you might find in the USA. I just think children deserve to be to know both sides of the story and make an informed decision. But the way I think things are going in education is that there is howls of protest about what I should be teaching. When I uh, it, it came out in, in, in the newspapers that Mr. Cowan is a, a creationist. There were, you know, there's a storm of protest, and I've been, you know, warned I'm not, I mustn't bring the school into disrepute. But I would say it's not fair on the children to censor, to um, with, withhold this information from them. And yes, that probably maybe it does belong in religious studies, but I don't know any RE teacher. And I apologise to those listening to me who might feel qualified. They just, the children won't get taught that unless a scientist does it. As we were saying earlier, there are, of course, many Christians who, who um, believe in creation in some sense, believe that God maybe started the universe off, maybe God even started life off. But they're evolutionists because the evidence is so is so strong, Wh why do you put yourself in such an extraordinarily difficult situation? I mean, you are seriously, as a chemistry teacher, arguing that the world is only 6,000 years old. I mean, that's just dotty. You cannot <laughs> say that. You can perfectly well be a creationist, be a Christian, and say, yes, I believe the, w the world is 4.5 billion years old, and that God created life or God created the universe, but don't fly in the face of what are obviously true facts. There are, there are theologians through the ages, like, and not my favourite theologian, but St Augustine, who would say, why did God take as long as six days to do it? Why is it so short? James Usher um, has a bad reputation. I think his work is a work of scholarship. I think it's, it's good stuff. I've got a, a, some material about Usher's um, uh, origin of the, of the, of the earth. J I, James Usher was, the, was the, the, bishop. Bit the bishop who calculated the age of the earth by adding up all those begats and, yes. and, so, and, and who lived and then, and then worked out that it was 4004 BC yes. on October the, the 23rd, what was it? I think. October but the 23rd at 9 a.m., was it? <laughs> well, it was evening and morning the first day. Yeah. We don't know what time. Uh, I wouldn't go as far as Usher, but I, I would say he was about right. And you see, this is the point. We start with a belief. I believe in a transcendent God. And once you do that, I'm afraid you can, you, you, the evidence from scripture draws me to that conclusion. And increasingly, the evidence from science draws me to that conclusion. I haven't always thought this way, of course. Um, my, I, I became a Christian, and I, what I like in your book, by the way, is I agree there's no such thing as a, a Christian child or a Catholic child or a Muslim child. I think that was excellent. I became a Christian 20, one, 22 years ago. And for many years, even as a Christian, I, tr I struggled to reconcile the stuff I was taught, the, the way in the media one is bombarded with evolution is a fact, isn't it? And it's taken me a long time to unlearn that. And you may think that's going completely in the wrong direction. But there was a time when I believed what you believed. And I'm not sure there's a time when you believe what you, you will be I, I mean, one day I hope you'll believe what I believe in terms of the existence of a personal God. But on the other hand, the mounting evidence that things are younger than they seem. Well, I mean, maybe one of these days I'll have a deathbed conversion and believe in some sort of personal God, but I sure as hell won't believe the world's only 6,000 years old. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Uh, well, I'm not sure it is. As I say, if just one method, let's look at Gentry's work on radio halos. 
in, um, I think it's polonium containing rocks. And again, I'm, I'm not a professional geologist, but there, is, there are studies on the internet that, that are available. Uh, from websites that you probably wouldn't like, like uh, AnswersInGenesis.org. Um, but they purport to show that the Earth cannot be more than, say, 10,000 years old. See, it sounds awfully like special pleading. I mean, what, what it sounds to me is, is that you've, you've decided for scriptural reasons that this, this is what you believe, and then you desperately go around looking for side. something to fit it, and, and you find something on some odd website somewhere. And, and, but you don't look at the, at the whole corpus of the evidence. But I've looked at that for years. I, I, think, I think you're right that is a criticism of the way I teach, but should children have the right to decide on these things? That's my point. Everybody I, has the right to decide I'm on not anti yeah. the teaching of evolution. I'm not going back to scopes. I mean, this is wrong. This is the common misconception. I'd like these things taught, but I'd like evolution as it's taught today to be critiqued in a, in a, in a scientific way. In the end, as a, a person of faith, and I think we all have faith, whether we have faith in the existence or non-existence or, or non-knowability of God, I think there are only two positions. We either believe or we don't. I think talk about probability in your book, which is very interesting. Um, in the end, there either is a God or there isn't. And I've chosen to ally myself but with the You just said you're an atheist about all those other gods. I mean, you're an atheist about <laughs> yes. Zeus and Jupiter and <laughs> Absolutely Thor. Absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so why choose that one? Um, I suppose this does come down to personal revelation. I, I did have an experience of God. I continue to have that experience when I share it with other people. It's a, it seems to be a common experience. Do you say I'm the god of the, of the Christians and the Jews? I'm, I'm not Zeus. I'm no, not Jupiter. No, he's the god of the whole world, but he is not. But he is the he is what we might call Jehovah Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the father of. Yeah, but how do you know that? Did he tell you? <laughs> Did he tell you I'm not Zeus? I'm not Baal? I'm not the god of the Australian Aborigines? He didn't. But I went through a phase in my mid thirties where, I suppose, I was searching. And I read the Quran. I've looked at some Hindu scriptures. I found scientific errors in those, of course. The earth on the back of an elephant. And you mean you didn't find any in the Bible? Well, I thought I did at the time. But, but since I've become a Christian, I, the more I look at the Bible, and it talks about God suspends the earth over nothing, which is gravity. Uh, the earth is a sphere, certainly not flat. There are things in the scriptures, actually, that would show that, <laughs> that, that it had a supernatural origin, not just the words of men. There, there's something about the, the constellations of Pleiades and Orion, which you've probably never looked at in the, in the book of Job, that have, were only verified in the 1930s when astronomers discovered the difference between a bounded and an unbounded star system. Now, there's a, a verse in the book of Job, and you might say this is coincidence, that talks about the Pleiades being unbounded and rapidly rushing apart. So, um, sorry, that's the wrong way around. Pleiades is stationary, so Tycho Brahe would have mapped this the same as we see it today. Uh, but Orion is, is whizzing apart, and all we see are the three stars in a line, the belt. There's a verse that you think, what, how did they know that? The water cycle is in the Bible. In the end, there are things in Scripture that, as a scientist, I had to come to terms with and say, who wrote that? And yes, in the end, it was a personal revelation. But only a revelation because I was, I was inquiring, is there a God? And I did that as many people have done over the generations, did the Jesus Christ rise from the dead? What, was the, what is the evidence, historical evidence, for the resurrection of Christ? And I came to this. It wasn't logic in the end. It was faith. But and once again, trust. Um, the bishops and vicars would agree about Christ. They would not agree with you about the age of the earth. I think we're not going to agree about that. Let's just say thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Professor. Yeah.